Like many young professionals today, I've learned a lot of what I know, not just from university and classes, but just finding content online through platforms like YouTube or Reddit and listening to a lot of podcasts. Specifically, when looking up content around geospatial maps or satellite images, one podcast rises to the top every time. Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. Daniel Lodono, who has been hosting the Mapscaping podcast for the past five years, releasing over 180 episodes and helping thousands of people along the way, navigating their careers, learning about new developments in the industry. Daniel has been a pretty big influence on me and a great support behind the scenes in my own journey through podcasting. That led to having him on the podcast about a year ago. A lot has changed since then. Mapscaping has grown even more over the past year, and more recently, Daniel made a drastic change. I quit my job as a GIS specialist slash consultant. Since his last time on the podcast, we also started having recurring calls talking about podcasting, maps, and just creating content online. So I wanted to ask Daniel to come on the podcast a second time, this time as a friend and a mentor. I know he puts a lot of thoughts into packaging ideas and telling stories. He's spoken to hundreds of professionals around the geospatial world. So I wanted to poke his brain about his thoughts about how people and companies market themselves in this industry. Before we get started with the interview, I want to thank today's sponsor, which is OpenCage. If you work with addresses and location data, chances are you're going to need a geocoder. Geocoding is the act of translating coordinates, so think latitude and longitude, that are created by smartphones and tracking devices into human understandable places, like street names and place names, or the other way around. So OpenCage provides a geocoding API, which is built on top of open data sources, one of them being OpenStreetMap. This allows them to provide their geocoding API at a pretty low cost, as well as having pretty loose licensing terms compared to proprietary platforms. So you can do things like store the data as long as you want, display it on any map, and use it publicly or behind a firewall. So if it's built on top of open data sources, you may be wondering, like, why wouldn't you be able to do it yourself? Well, you can totally make your own geocoder, but what OpenCage provides is just a simple API that works and that is reliable, basically to take care of all the maintenance. For example, OpenStreetMap alone gets edited four to five million times a day. On top of that, OpenCage provides information like local time zones, what currency people use, and which phone code is used. Because OpenCage is based around open data, that means their pricing is also pretty affordable. And they have a pretty generous free trial that I encourage you to go take a look, especially if you're just playing around or are doing a personal project. Finally, which is pretty close to my heart, they've been long supporters of the open source community and just geospatial community as a whole. So if this sounds interesting, you can go to the link in the description to see more about them. Hey, Daniel, um, thanks for coming on the podcast again for the second time. I'm pretty excited to, to have you on again. It's really great to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Thanks. I, uh, I usually have a great opening question that I can ask to people who I've never had on before. I ask them how they describe themselves. And so I started thinking to myself, OK, I can't just ask the same question again. Like, so. What I wanted to do instead was I, I re-listened to the first uh, interview that we've had together. Um, and I wanted to, first of all, ask, like, do you actually remember what you said back then? And if not, I, I can I can cue you in on that. I think I think I remember small pieces of it. Yeah, but I, I couldn't repeat it word for word. That's for sure. I might have said something about uh, being curious, perhaps maybe enjoying uh, sort of risky sports, maybe something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It was it was very interesting because you were not just talking about like your work. It started with a lot of who you are as as a person, as a father, family. Like you've you've done a lot of sports, um, and that's on the individual sports specifically is something that you mentioned. Um, and the reason I bring that up is we recorded that episode a bit more than a year ago, I think, something like that, and I wanted to ask do you think anything would change in the answer that you gave that great question max um would anything change no i think 
I think it's still the, the same. Like, I think a lot of that stuff is still me uh, as a person. I mean, I, I think we're changing and evolving all the time, of course. But I think, you know, that's the kind of statement, that, the bits of it that I remember anyway, where I'm, I'm still pretty confident that, that that's, that's who I am. Right. Do, do, you, do you think anything has changed, though, on the, on the last year? You, you do mention, like, people change and anything. What might have changed over the past year? I think, I don't know, I think perhaps my world has become even more nuanced than what it was before. I think uh, I'm still looking for that balance in things. I'm looking for the balance in my work. I'm looking for the balance in my free time, balancing that with the time I want to spend with my family, with the time I need for myself, uh, the, the time I spend on, on, on you know, mapscaping, the time, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm still looking for that balance, I, I guess, and that hasn't changed but i think my focus on it has changed if, if that makes sense right so, yeah, yeah 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 so th this is one of the reasons why i wanted us to talk together i mean not that we necessarily need reasons usually to talk together but specifically to, to have a, a more uh like a proper conversation it is is about like one of the things that has changed since last time is that you've quit your job on the side um and that's one of the things that I'd like to, to touch on is what that process was like. I, I can imagine it wasn't just one day you woke up and you were like, you know what? What I really need is to quit my job. <laughs> um, so before we get there, can you um, take take me and the listeners maybe back a little bit like six months ago or a year ago where you were and what led you to deciding I'm I'm quitting my job? Well, I, I think we probably need to go back even a little bit further. I think sure. maybe you know, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, I'd be more realistic. So I've always had the, for a long time now, I've had this sort of inkling that I, that I want to do something else, that I, that I want to try something else. And it started with just being frustrated at my work, I think, like doing, do, doing these repetitive tasks. And when you walk around with a bunch of ideas in your head, like, like I do, of how things could be or what might be possible, or you're interested in technology and trying out new things, that... Being a specialist in a specific area and then being asked to do specific tasks again and again and again can be can be really frustrating. And I think too, if we went back in time even a little bit further, so eight nine years ago, we lost um, my wife's father. He was out for a run one day, so and we were really close. He was out for a run one day, and just uh, died, just fell over in the forest. And we found him two days later. So we were the first on the scene. We, we knew which way he he usually run usually ran and there'd been a storm. So the, the forest was closed and we, we found him just lying there on the ground, looking like you know, as if someone had just thrown away some used clothes it, and it was horrific. And that's looking at him. Like I can still see it in my mind today. Looking at him, you know, was the start of thinking, wow, we're not here forever. And it sounds re really cliche, but it may, you know, you walk away from something like that and you have to really think about your life. Where, where am I going? What, what am I doing? What makes me happy? What, what makes me sad? What, what is giving me energy? What's taking energy away from me? So I think about that's when I, I knew that I had to start making some active decisions. And, and, you know, that was a long time ago now. My father, you know, two years after that, after we, we lost Nina's, my, my wife's dad, he got diagnosed with a, a terminal disease. So it, it ends really badly. And along the way, it's not pretty. And again, like looking at those, looking at those events, looking at those those crises that happen in your life. I mean, you just you, you have to start rethinking things. Hopefully, you come to the conclusion that yes, I'm doing the right thing. But that wasn't the case for me. So yeah, that's I guess if we had to go back that far, that's probably when it started. And then this sort of increasing frustration. It's like a little seed that you plant inside yourself, and it and it grows. You know what I mean? And yeah, so so that's really when it started. Is is back then. And then leading up to that, I started Mapscaping five years ago. And this has all just been a process in, in evolution until the point where, uh, you know, three, two, two months ago, I had a conversation with my, you know, at work. And I you know, just said, look, look, I, I'm done. I've got to move on. And then I, I'd like to say that we made a plan. I'd like to say that there was some sort of, some sort of handover involved, but uh, it wasn't quite that organized, but that's all right. So I've, the last couple of months, I've just been doing what I can to sort of hand over my, my tasks. 
you know, upskill the next person who's going to take over from me. And, um, and, and mentally, I'm um, just moved on, essentially. And now, and now the big question is, can I make mapscaping work or what to do next, I guess? I want to linger on, on that just a little bit more. First of all, thanks for sharing that. I, I know it's not always easy, so I really do appreciate it. Um, how did you go from you, you, you have these pretty transformative experiences and as you said, it plants that seed. And there's years that happen to the moment where you, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to quit what I'm doing because it's not working. And of course you have Mapscaping, the, the podcast that you've been hosting for the past, I think, four years. Um, uh, what I'm curious about is what are the steps that you took along the way again? Because we, we've just condensed, I think, nine years, you said, in, in, into a few sentences. Um, but did you make a plan in your head? I, I want to explore that a little bit more, what that process was like. I'm sure there are people who are listening who might be at the same stage. And sometimes you have that sense of, of not knowing what direction to go, where to go. It, it seems like this monumental task. I, I just would like to ask if you could break that down a little bit, what it was like for you. Yeah. It's like when that, that old saying, how do you, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. And I think people, <laughs> and for me, I think people need to understand the amount of momentum you actually need to gather before even just taking that first bite. I mean, for me, this was a, a long time. So for me, and I'm not saying, please, no one listening do this, but for me, it took like two years to start making a decision like, okay, I'm going to do something because there's so much sort of structural inertia holding you in place that to move out of that requires a, a lot of momentum. At least it did for me, a lot of sort of mental momentum, if, if that makes sense. Um, so the, for me, the journey looked like this. I started listening to a lot of podcasts. So that was information. It's almost like the research stage, gathering information, finding out, hearing stories, like positive stories of people that had made it, had done something different, had a, created a business that worked out. And um, yeah, just sort of that understanding it was possible, what is possible, what the steps might look like. And then I started trying a lot of things. So one of the first things we tried was Mapscaping was originally a, an e-commerce store. So we tried to sell um, maps online, right? So we made a lot of maps and there's a whole story behind that, tried to sell them online. Uh, and, and we did, like we sold maps online and we learned a lot by doing it. We, I think I had some magnets one stage made in, in China and shipped over here. So I had an idea that if you put, uh, got like these little reflective badges that and my idea was kids could stick them on their clothes without ruining their clothes. And if they were reflective on both sides and a magnet on the other side, you could just, you know, put them inside your, your pockets or whatever magnet inside the pocket and then reflect a badge here. It'd be fun. You could change them out. They would reflect, they'd stay on the clothes. They would, um, you know, you could get yeah, without ruining things. So we got some of them made in China and started exploring that idea, uh, shipped them to Denmark, which was a process in itself. Along the way, we made uh, socks as well for mapscaping. You're yeah, looking for that perfect sort of e-commerce product, well, something that's that fits everyone. Everyone needs socks. You run out of socks, that's great because you need to buy some more. Uh, there's no socks for map people, all, all this kind of stuff. We really just started exploring a lot of things. And, and I'm glossing over so much here. And most of it, for us anyway, it, it doesn't work. It's just this huge exploration. And there's way more mistakes than there are successes. And looking back on it, it's kind of amazing that for some reason you can almost like trick yourself into, into just keeping going. Like you, you need this real sort of drive. And at times I remember thinking I was a bit disappointed from, you know, the stories that I'd been listening to, they're all about these sort of almost overnight successes, right? Like people are now we're making, and it's all, you know, six figures and seven figures, this and blah, 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 blah. And looking back on it, you're like, ah, oh, it's not that easy, people. It's hard. That might be, I think those stories are great because they motivate you and they, you know, and things like this are possible to do that. Of, of course they are. But they kind of gloss over the journey that you need to go on to get there. So for me, it started with that education piece, like, okay, so listening to podcasts for me, can I hear some positive stories, please? Can I uh, learn a little bit from you? And then trying a whole bunch of things that, that ultimately don't work, but you learn a lot along the way. And, and I can imagine it's it's also about taking those steps, like getting magnets from China. I'm, I'm sure you learn a lot about, okay, these are all the things I'm never going to do again, but these yeah, are the exactly. two things that did work and I'm going to build on, on, on that. And I think 
I feel like that's what builds momentum, like builds the momentum in the other direction as well. Yeah, exactly. And you know, along the way, you do have little successes, and it's amazing how much a success can can drive you. So I'll, I'll never forget the day we launched our, our you know, mapscaping dot com as a as the e commerce store that it was, and it looked terrible. It was rough. We didn't tell anyone that we were doing it, and then one day we sent out an email to our extremely small list and group of friends and said, "Hey, we're doing this thing. Surprise!" And we sold something, and it was unbelievable. Like that, that feeling. And it's still a little bit like this today when you, when I sell something, when someone gives me money for some, some work that I'm doing, something that I made, you know, that here I made this and someone looks you in the eye and says, ah, I see what you've done. I see that you have made this. I can see that there's nowhere for you to hide. There's no team for you to hide behind. Here is some money. Like I put value on this. It, it, it's unbelievable. It, it's the best game in town. I would also imagine that once you have that, it's, it's like a proof of concept. About like okay now it's not about doing that you, you've done the zero to one to use the this famous Peter Thiel analogy of now you you've done the zero to one which is the the, the hardest part uh, allegedly about getting started and then now it's getting from one to n because if you can replicate that a hundred times a thousand times now you're you're making a living out of it yeah yeah exactly but it it is so hard. And again, it comes back to that momentum, like getting yeah. going, like getting past all, all the mistakes and all the failures along the way and keeping moving forward and also learning from them, of course, right? Because, like, I mean, banging your head against the wall, something that's not working is, is not helping. But it's a hard process. One, one of the things I think about when I hear stories like this is there's this transformative experience that, that, that creates this surge of uh, this like – identity crisis a little bit of like oh my god what am i doing in life uh and i i feel like that happens for multiple things in in life it can be for for um careers for relationships for health as well a lot of people get into working out for, for reasons like this i'm always a little bit wary of those because they are great for an initial surge but they usually don't last. They don't, motivation doesn't last. It doesn't get you coming again and again and again, which is what you need if you want change over, over a long time. How did you change, or, or did you actually, maybe I'm wrong, change from that big transformative experience to that working out over, over nearly a decade to, to create that change? Well, I think you're right. Like, at the, you know, at the start, when you're motivated, when you're highly motivated, you don't need a lot of people clapping and cheering you on to keep the momentum going or to start because you were going to do it anyway. It's nice that they do that. But what you really need is that sustained motivation. You know, you need, you need that momentum when you don't feel like it, when you're unmotivated. That's, that's when you need the help. Um, so how did I keep going? Well, I, I guess it depends on what's driving you. Um, and I think sometimes knowing that you don't want to go back, uh, knowing that it's more uncomfortable to stay where you are than it is to move forward, I, I think that that's, that's a driver, right? I, I can remember what it was like sitting in that job, looking out into the next 30, 40 years of my life and knowing what it was going to be like. And that, that sounds really negative, right? But if you have that feeling, that, that's pretty motivating. That's pretty powerful. And again, it's maybe what, what is more uncomfortable? It was no doubt it's uncomfortable doing this, like trying to make a business, trying to create your, your own job, essentially create something that didn't exist before uh, by yourself. It's really uncomfortable, but it's not as uncomfortable as it is to stand still, at, at least for me. Right. Being confronted to that uh, pain, let's say, every day is like pushed you nudged you to like okay this is not what i want to do and i have to confront this again yeah and, and okay i understand another thing i i have a lot of respect for you is the um this promise that you make to to the audience that you have you're very upfront about you are going to show up on a on a regular basis and and it sounds like you're building this structure around that this thing that is no matter what happens, there's an episode that's going to come out you know, within reason. And 
Uh, the reason I, I have a lot of respect for that is because it takes the motivation out of the equation. It's not, mm. I will do this whenever I want. It's, I will do this because in three days, something needs to come out and I don't want it, but it's like a job. I don't, you don't go to a job when you feel like it. You go to a job because today is Tuesday. It's 8 a.m. So you have to head to work and building, like having the rigor, putting that on yourself and not having someone external saying that. I, I, I do have a lot of respect for that. And I'd like to dive again a, a little bit into that as to how you build that for yourself. Well, I think I, I, so. I'm trying to be. Uh, I'm not doing this as a hobby. So I want to be. I want to be a professional, and that, that sounds, you know, almost a little bit entitled. Like I, I want to do podcasting as as a profession, but I, I do. So that's what I need to work towards. And you, you know what this is like. Sometimes you don't feel like it, but you've made a promise to a promise to the guest, a promise to the audience, a promise to yourself. You've made all these promises. You've made all these decisions. And sometimes it's easier instead of making a new decision just to keep moving forward. You know, I'm not saying you shouldn't look at things and go, well, you know, is this going to, you know, is this still the right thing? You should definitely do that. But sometimes it's just easier to, instead of making new decisions, just say, well, I've made this one decision. I'm going to stick with it. And again, I think being a professional is about being a professional. It's about showing up whether, whether you want to or not. It's about making it work because it's not always perfect. Like the, the guest isn't always perfect. The audio isn't always perfect. I'm not always feeling, you know, a, a, um, a hundred thousand percent, but that's, that, that's part of it. Can you show up anyway? And, and you, I've got to, I see it as a challenge. Can I show up anyway? Can I do this anyway? Despite that. And who am I showing up for? Well, the guest, of course, for myself, for the reputation and the brand that I'm trying to build and for the people that I'm, I'm seeking to serve. My, my guess is that the people that listen to, to the Mapscaping podcast don't want me to show up and say, oh, look, I'm really tired today, people. I, I'm really, I'm sad. I, I just don't have the energy. I don't feel like it. My guess is that, that they want that consistency. So how do I add that consistency? And, and that is, again, making this promise. And to be clear, I've broken that promise a number of times, and I'll probably do it again in, in the future as well. Because you know, sometimes your mental health needs to be taken into consideration as well. Everyone needs a holiday. But I, I'm, yeah, I, I beat myself up quite a bit when I have to break that promise. But that, that's why I do it, is because I think that if, you're going, if you want to be paid and treated like a professional, then you need to act professionally. And part of that is, for me anyway, is, is this idea of consistency. And I, I, I think sometimes people confuse consistency with uh, authenticity as well. So I, I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be consistent. C could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, so, and, and this is an idea I've stolen from someone else, but it really resonates with me. So again, authenticity. You know, to be authentic, sometimes I would show up and say, look, I I'm tired. Oh, my kids have been screaming at me all day. I've had a tough day at work. My back's sore for whatever reason. That would be authentic, right? So, of course, I I'm exaggerating. <laughs> I'm being a bit dramatic here, but, but you get the idea. Consistency would be showing up and acting in a way that is consistent with the way that I've acted before, that professional manner. So sometimes we're all human, right? You're a human. I'm a human. The people listening are humans. We, we go up and down in terms of our motivation, <laughs> in terms of the, the uh, our happiness, our sadness levels, or, or whatever you want to say. But that consistency, I think, is really important. And I think, I, and I think that's how you build a brand, is people have certainty around the way that you're going to show up, the things that you're going to tell them. So there's the certain things that I do on my podcast every time, and, and I know you do the same thing. You're building in that consistency. There's going to be opportunities to surprise and hopefully delight people within the episode itself, but it needs to be packaged in a consistent way. I don't want to surprise them. Like today I'm riding an elephant and talking to Dave, you know, th this is not a consistent thing, but yeah, I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. But I think, I think this, yeah. And I see it on social media a lot, this idea where you need to strip mine your life for these dramatic events and post them and say, Oh, look, I'm being authentic. Yeah. 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 Is it? Is it, is it helpful? Is that what, like, are you doing it because you think it's going to be helpful for the audience? And sometimes it is, right? It's helpful to share. It's helpful to be open. It's helpful to be vulnerable. 
but I think it's more helpful to do that in a, in a consistent way. Like again, a promise that you can keep. So I'm not lying. I'm not pretending to be someone else when I show up on my podcast. When I, when I sit here with you, I'm not pretending to, this is me, this is who I am, but there's also all these other sides of me, but I've picked one bit of me and said, well, this is a promise I can keep. This is the kind of consistency that, that, that I can have. And this is the way I can show up in, in a professional manner. So that, that's the way I think about it anyway. I, I think I, I, I do resonate with what you're saying. And I think I have changed my mind over the process of doing this podcast about what being authentic means. I, I like your example of if I was being authentic, it's not like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm having a bad day and like spilling it out as it is unfiltered. I think the, the major change I've done is allowing myself to put some filters in to say, okay, if I tidy the visuals and the background and I tidy the audio up and I try to make it sound good, that's not being inauthentic because I just, it's, it's me caring and then deciding what needs to be uh, polished basically. And what is allowing me to still be myself, but, but taking that and rather than saying authenticity is the raw material and any change to it is moving away from the authenticity and, and changing my mind to, okay, being authentic is you still have the raw material, but you make something a little bit more polished out of it. And this was very clear when I listened to the first interview that we did together. It was painful for me to listen to because there was all these little things that I realized I've started doing along the way in the past year or so of doing of having these conversations that make them a little bit more polished. And I feel like I have the impression, at least, I'm still authentic in the conversations that I have, but they're a more refined product in the end but it's not because it's a sellout i'm a sellout or because i'm i'm not genuinely saying what i have on my mind it's that there's a better process of getting there uh, another thing it makes me think of is this concept of uh, writers it's, it's very prominent for writers that some of them just write whenever they want but a lot of them also have this set out schedule of when they're going to write and that's how they move away from this blank page problem about like no today is the moment where i write and i the most important aspect is getting started and as soon as i get started the ideas will come flowing in and that's when i'm being genuine that they're still my thoughts and how i think but saying it's not authentic or genuine because when I sat down, I didn't have those ideas is, is the wrong prism to see it through. And I, I think through having some of our conversations, I've changed my mind a little bit on what really being authentic can mean. Uh, I'm glad I've helped you. You change your mind on that because you've helped me with so many times, you know, you've motivated me and pushed me and you know, it, it's been great having, having, having the discussions that we have. I absolutely love it. it this, this reminds me of what, uh, like Joe Morrison said to me once, he said, uh, that the best writers are also the best editors. You know, and, and I guess think about that. Like, does that mean that they're, because they're editing their work that they're inauthentic? I, I don't think so. I think you nailed it before when you said they care. They also care enough to make the effort to think about how they're going to package it, how they're going to put it in such a format that it's going to help the people that they're trying to help. That's a, that's a, that's something worth i think pondering on because i also think i've changed my mind on on editing not just a podcast but writing and and video as well like just storytelling and and realizing that when you change a cut when you add music you're not taking away from the authenticity you're building on top of it, it it's it's empowering it rather than having this purest vision of if if there's the slight tweak of edits of if you boost the gain on your microphone it's not authentic anymore because it's not the raw thing it's like where do you put the dial on that I, I i do think editing has doesn't get enough credit first of all i think we we put too much emphasis on the the creating like producing part and not on the editing as much just on this podcast i've gotten an editor um peter hello and he's doing an amazing job at also helping, like taking a look at being a little bit more ruthless about this. We we don't need to keep this. This doesn't add anything and it's not 
being inauthentic. It's being, I see it as being considerate towards the people who are listening as well. Like, oh, this is wasting people's time more than it's adding to the to the conversation to anything. And it's not taking away as much. So I, I, I can really get behind that. I, I couldn't agree more. Tell tell me what happened with your last episode. So you published this episode and it was pretty clear to me that you put so much effort into it, way more effort than the other episodes. And I think that this might be an interesting discussion point because this was the first, this was a this was a step change as far as I'm concerned with some of the work that you've been doing. It was a massive leap forwards. Um, so in a massive amount of editing you put into it, a massive amount of thought you put into it. Can you tell me what the reaction was? So did people yell at you and say, this is inauthentic, you've, you've ruined it? <laughs> what, what was the reaction? Yeah, so, so for people listening, we're talking about the interview with Steve Coast that I did, the founder of OpenStreetMap. And to I just want to add a little bit of context for people listening. So the this episode, we recorded it in person with Steve. Um, it's three hours long. And it's it's the most highly produced episode I've done so far. We have three different camera angles. There's a, a whole intro on it, um, and yeah, it, it has been a a step change um, in in how the episodes are produced. It's not going to be all of those are like this anymore. Like moving forward, I mean, but the I think that's a great point. Like the reaction was, wow, this is awesome. Um, more than oh my god you edited something how dare you this is inauthentic like it was quite the opposite it was um, a lot of people disagreed with what Steve um, talked about but a lot of people were thankful for the conversation as well like for like oh this is interesting to hear this other opinion um, Steve is this incredibly smart person who's also quite opinionated but it, I think you have to be if you start a project like OpenStreetMap that pretty much changes mapping uh, as as we know it today. And I think the the change was, what am I trying to do here? What's the goal with this conversation? And the goal is to get people interested and to provide a a spotlight and a, a platform for Steve to tell his ideas. And my job is just like it is now is to take someone and, and help them navigate through their thoughts and kind of poke around a little bit. And that means that sometimes I don't phrase a question correctly. I mumble, I'm still pretty bad at doing short, concise questions. And there's things like that, or especially a great example for the uh, interview with Steve is hopefully nobody noticed. And if we did our job correctly, nobody did notice, but the uh, camera that I used to uh, record myself kept shutting down every half an hour and Steve alludes to it at the end of the conversation but that meant that every half an hour the camera would shut down and I would have to get up and I would have to save the recording and hit record again and sit down and rephrase the question and and Steve was very accommodating and, and very understanding um, but you you don't see any of that in the conversation we we yeah. cut that out we spend a lot of time uh, trying to see that we spend a lot of time at the beginning of changing camera angles so that people get a feeling for the room. There's a lot that goes into that to create a feeling and an experience. There's music in the intro. Uh, there's all these things because I think I've changed my mind through a lot of the conversations we've had towards my goal is to put the focus on this person and for them, for their ideas to come out and that means that sometimes there's a sense of rhythm that you need to to think about things like that. So, so I have thought a lot about it and hopefully it gets to the point where nobody actually notices all of these things anyways. And, and you're trying, because if you do your job well, people focus on the content and everything else, the production is just a tool to elevate that. Yeah. What, what do they say? Good design is invisible. It doesn't mean it was easy and it doesn't mean someone didn't put a lot of thought and effort into it. It means that it, it didn't get in the way of what you're doing. It enhanced the experience so much so that you were in the experience as opposed to noticing the design and, at least. And, and when I looked at that, that episode with Steve Coast, I, I was, frankly, I, I was blown away. I remember reading one of the comments saying, this is the, 
this is the new gold standard for for interviewing and storytelling and geospatial. And uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think you did such a brilliant job. But it, it, isn't it interesting? You you did so much work there. You were uh, you, you polished it. You thought about it, and the response was overwhelming. People loved it. What, what, what do you think? So we've been talking about making content, me and you, for for the last couple of minutes here. What, what do you think other people can learn from this? For me, like a, the idea of packaging our ideas, of packaging our thoughts, and rethinking how we're doing that is is really important. But do you think this can be applied in other sort of other jobs or other tasks or other bits of people's lives? Yeah, I think uh, I think first of all, that's a great question. You ask pretty good questions, Daniel. <laughs> I think for me, it, it, it I, I've thought about it a little bit. I think it's, it, it, I really do think it came from a, a sort of entitlement that my ideas are wonderful and people will care about them because they're amazing ideas and worth listening to. Um, and exactly not being aware that so much work had been done in the things that I look up to, in the design, in the aesthetics, in the choices. And a lot of times if something looks easy, it's that people are incredibly good at it, that they've taken away the effort for you so that you can just focus on what they want you to focus on. And I just completely fell for that and and didn't realize how much work there was. And I think that's the the thing that a lot of people could probably uh, take away from. I, I I think it helps me a lot in my technical job. I'm a data scientist during the day, realizing that I think this thing is super interesting. How do I frame it in a way that people understand that as well, rather than they're going to put effort in to have to understand it. The, the way I, the mental framework I have for that is there's a sort of um, cost of understanding. There's a, a price to pay for people for information to go from one person to the other. And you can decide to do a, a, a pretty poor job at explaining something. And that means you're transferring the cost to the other person that has to understand and figure out, out what are you talking about? And like, okay, okay, I see this. And maybe they have to ask you more questions to figure it out. And the way I'm, I'm seeing that is you as the person saying you don't see that cost you're just like oh it's this and that and and you don't pay the consequences of that and i felt that the the mental framework the the framework the the switch has been i'll do that work so that it takes a lot less work for the other person and they can mm-hmm. i've done all the heavy lifting i've done the 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 job of figuring out what's the best analogy what's the best example and they can just come in and consume that idea and and then just walk away and they didn't have to do to put a lot of work into that. I think that's the biggest change that's happened over the past year or so of doing this that I think is applicable in in a relationship when you're trying to tell someone how you're feeling about a certain situation or at a job when you're trying to advocate for a budget increase of this project you're working on. And, and to be clear, I think when you look at the like the the bell curve of your audience, there's some people that will pay that price no matter what. They will mm-hmm. pay the cost because and that they will want to pay the cost. They want it to be a little bit difficult. They want to know that no, oh, it's only people like me that can do things like this. That that they, they want to know that. And other people, you'll you you'll restrict your your audience size. That like you exactly. restrict the people that you're listing. So it, it's a balance, right? Because who is your audience? If they're a technical audience, they want that there needs to be a, or they can more easily pay that higher cost because they're already there anyway. So it, it, it is kind of a balance, but yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think, I think packaging is important. I think, and it shows that you care. Yeah. I, I think the, the way I think about this, if I were to give advice to people, here's a piece of completely unsolicited uh, advice is I think you as a, person you want to be able to put in the work to understand what other people are doing when you're talking when someone is talking to you but you want to be someone who puts in the work for others so that it's easier to understand it so i have a a much higher standard for myself than i have for the people who i I hope are going to be listening to the things i do because there are people exactly there's going to be a a hardcore uh um maybe that's not the right term but there's going the to true be people, believers the true believers thank you that's a much better way of seeing it like and those people are quite vocal as well because they're they're your closer friends um they're, they're people who really care and who want to to um let you know about that but there's also this 
people who just come in and 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 who have many other things in their life going on and and yeah. i think having that higher standard but being generous you've mentioned you you talk about this concept of being generous uh, as well in, in that aspect um i'm curious have you had a similar shift in that yes yeah, so, so, i have for sure i have um but when i started in terms of like podcasting content creation i knew i wanted to make things that that i was proud of and i was so frustrated by you know these podcasts where people just you know smack the the blue yeti uh which is a a microphone you really need to know how to use it's extremely sensitive in the middle of the table and then there's three dudes sitting around cracking beers and talking about stuff and it was this unstructured conversation and i found that really really difficult to navigate i found the audio difficult to consume the storyline was hard to follow and maybe that wasn't the point maybe you know maybe that wasn't the point at all uh, maybe that's what wasn't what they were trying to do but i knew from those experiences that i want to do something different so i started off that i brought a good microphone i, I thought heavily about the a lot about the audio I, i did a lot of editing right from the start but i've definitely shifted along the way so i think i've published something around 180 episodes now and there's no doubt in my mind that my understanding of what is good enough ha has changed and at some at some stage it's gone up like i've increased the expectation i, I want to do more of a certain kind of editing or structure my interviews in a, in a certain kind of way and other in other ways uh, i've let go because i thought well Actually, this is not moving the dial. This is the thing. If I shift my focus from here, I can put more focus over there and something that really matters to people and makes a difference. So it's definitely been the evolution for me too. I, I want to take this as an opportunity to um, switch the conversation up a little bit um, and then kind of follow up on. An another big topic uh, I wanted us to talk about today is kind of the relationship the two of us have been growing over the past uh, year or so. Um, mostly after we had the first recording where we've started having these conversations together. You actually offered uh, to have conversations on a, on a regular basis to um, just be a mentor, basically, for, for me, who was just starting out and still in many ways is about how, how do we talk to, to people in, in the outside world? How do we do this thing that's podcasting? Um, and it's it's evolved a little bit over, uh, I was going to say over the years, but no, it's only been one for now. Um, well, I think it's a, I think you're being generous there when you say it's evolved a little bit. It's evolved a lot, I think, <laughs> at, at, le at least from my side. C could you, uh, okay, I'll, I'll put the burden on you. Could you, could you describe a little bit uh, what what we do and how it got started? I'm also curious before that, why did you uh, decide to to say like, To, to reach out and, and to, to want to have these sessions together? I think because I, I need this too. Like I need support. I need, to, and I think everyone needs this. Everyone, there's not many people that want to feel alone. And if you feel alone, you, you know what I mean. And if it doesn't really matter what you feel alone in, it's, it's not great. Just that I am alone. It's, it's not usually a wonderful thing. Um, so that, that's part of it was for me. Part of it was for me. And part of it is something I do on a regular basis. So I meet, have the opportunity to, to meet a lot of people, talk with a lot of people. And I'm constantly asking, like, what well, can we collaborate on something? Can we do something together? Where, where are you going? How can I help you get there? Maybe you can help me where I'm going as well. And it's super interesting doing this because what you discover is that a lot of people want to go somewhere, but they're not on the way. They want the journey, but they haven't started yet. And the question is, If you are on the journey, how much can you pull them? Like how much pulling and pushing do they need to start? And so what I saw in you, and this sounds like a father talking to a son, it's <laughs> not the way I see our relationship at, at all. I see it as equals. Um, so what I saw was you, you're already on the journey. So you're already started. You're, you're done a few episodes by that stage and You were putting in effort and you were putting in time. And when I talked to you, you had these ideas and you were motivated. And yeah, and I thought, well, here, I, I don't have to push this person. He, he's on the way already. I just have to walk beside this person and it'll be motivating for me. And hopefully it'll be helpful for him. And, and that's, that's how, how that, that's what I saw. I mean, obviously it's evolved. At the start, I, I guess I thought I can help this guy You know, I can share some of my knowledge or some of the things I've learned along the way and 
just having someone to talk to would be motivating for me. And, and that's, that was, that was kind of arrogant, that, that approach at the start. And now when we, when we talk, so we have, for the listeners, we have these sort of biweekly meetings. And you know, most of the time we schedule an hour, and most of the time they're significantly longer than that. And I always walk away from the conversation saying, I wasn't finished yet. I could have done more of that. And thinking, and being, and thinking I, I got the best deal there. <laughs> I, I, I won. <laughs> yeah, I got more out of that than, than that other guy did. And that's not being mean or nasty or, or trying to sort of get as much as I can or being extractive in terms of our relationship. It's just not always clear to me who's getting the best deal, which means, at least in my mind, that we're both winning. Can you elaborate on, on the things that you get out of those conversations? So we, we, we talk about, um, we bounce ideas off each other a lot. Um, <clears throat> When uh, when I was preparing for the the interview with Steve, I sent you a bunch of the preparation work that I was doing. Uh, there's the same way when you have ideas, we we send messages to each other a lot, um, just just to try to explain a little bit what these are. Um, there's a lot of bouncing ideas off each other. We give each other feedback. Uh, I'm curious, what is it for you that you take away from those? And maybe interesting for the people listening, how. What should people be looking for as well in, in trying to develop these sorts of, I don't know if mentoring is this is the correct word, but at least these kinds of relationships. Okay, so so what, I, what I'm looking for is a sounding board. Here's my idea. What do you think? And I'm looking for honest feedback, you know, packaged in, in a nice way. No one wants to be yelled at. And if you, when I approach you with an idea, it's usually because I've thought about it a little bit. I've got, I've got some skin in the game already. It's, you know, I've spent some time uh, mulling it over, trying to think of, of how it might work, how, you know, where it might fall apart. And so what I'm looking for is, is feedback, not necessarily confirmation that it's going to work, but feedback. Someone say, ah, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And I'm the kind of person I, I need to say things out loud. And so when we talk, I get to say things out loud at you. <laughs> and, and then oftentimes you, yeah, you, you point me in the right direction. I, I feel like it, you're you're not afraid to say that. Have you thought about this? Why? Who's that for? And this is a question I ask myself all the time. But for some reason, you seem to be able to ask it at at, at places or yeah, you know, in topics that that I haven't done it before. Or it's just great to hear it from someone else, and it makes you rethink it. Like, yeah, who is this for? Haven't you tried that before? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I have. That's right. That's right. But it's like these lessons I need to learn repeatedly, unfortunately, but, but I do. And you're, you're brilliant at that. And also you are, uh, well, I should say for the people, people listening or watching this, uh, I think it's important to have someone who's also got some skin in the game, who's moving in the same direction, because it's hard to explain. You know, so I, I work in, in GIS and every GIS person, you know, explain, and someone says, well, what do you do? I do GIS. Oh, what's that? And you're like, ah, oh, oh my God. Yeah. What is that? Right. Where, where do I go? And that's hard. And you can see people's eyes roll, you know, start to glaze over three seconds into the conversation because they don't get it. But when you meet someone who gets it, who's on the same path, who's doing something similar and is equally motivated. Oh, wow. That, that, you know, in that situation, it's, it's one plus one equals three. So I'm looking for both sides of that. I'm looking for that balance. I'm looking for that motivation, someone who's moving in the same direction where we can you know, almost slipstream each other at different times, we bounce ideas off each other and still get that. And it, but it's not all just confirmation, like, yes, you're amazing. Yes, you're a rock star. It's not all that. It's also, did you think about this? We've talked about this before. Why don't you do these things here? I see it working somewhere else. And it's two people looking to, to, to help each other. And it's, it's amazing. And it's yeah, hard I to find because I've tried this a few times before. It's hard to find. But when you when you find it, it's worth making the effort and, and holding on to it. I I do want to offer like the other perspective on on how I feel about it because uh, first of all, it's pretty interesting because a lot of things that you just said, I I usually say the same thing when people ask um, about like oh the having that honest feedback about. Uh, are you sure you really want to do that thing? Like, okay, let's go through. So you're telling me you want to do this and which leads to that, right? And then this, right? And then this, is that really what you want? And like having <clears throat> this person who you know you're going to bring something forward and 
but they have good intention because they care about the thing that you're doing and not being like, that's a stupid idea. And then you're like, oh, yeah. Oh. It, but but walking through like that does sound appealing, but you need to understand there's this aspect that comes with it. I think that's been great. And, and this having someone who gets it as well, a lot of the times it's, it's again, this idea that you're doing something and you're super excited about it. A lot of other people kind of roll their eyes. It's like, okay, great. Uh, oh, you have yet another podcast uh, to to talk about that. But someone who can share the motivation with is incredibly valuable. And I I, I do think it's also pretty hard to find some someone like that. I, from my perspective, it was also really scary reaching out to you the the first time to just record an episode. I think we might have chatted um on 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 twitter uh before but i also want to provide that that point of view that i think it sometimes it's worth reaching out to the people that you look up to because i did and i still do look up to you um to say hey can we have a chat i have a few ideas i'd love to run them through you maybe i have some feedback as well from from my point of view on what you're doing like having something to offer to to, to people yeah, I think is very valuable and is, is I, I try to do that for myself to be like, I, I this person's probably too busy. Let me not uh, bother them. Someone reached out to me and said that uh, I, they were like, oh, I, I thought you were going to be super busy. I didn't want to reach out. And I was like, what are you even talking about? Like, no, this is amazing. Thank you for, for reaching out. And I'm sure if you're, uh, you know, uh, a Bill Gates or something, yeah, you're probably really busy and, and don't have time for every single person who reaches out to you. But, but many times I think people are delighted when that happens. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. I think it's very, it's very flattering when someone reaches out and says, hey, I, I see you. I see what you're doing. I wonder if I could help. Um, that said, I have experienced it a couple of times where people have done this and they've created a bunch of, of, of work for me essentially because they've made promises and then they haven't kept them. And like, this would never stop me from from trying to connect with people, from trying to collaborate with people, from trying to, you know, have this, this kind of relationship. But once you've, once you've been through those experiences quite a few times, it also makes you realize like, oh, this is different. Oh, I reached out to this person and then they followed up and they did this thing here. And you don't have to do a great deal to stand out as far as that goes. I think people underestimate that all the time or overestimate, I should say, what it takes to actually stand out because, most most people don't follow up. Most people don't connect. They don't show up again and again and again. And I, again, I, th I think when you find that, you should you should definitely hold on to it because it's invaluable. And also understand that it'll change. So, you know, our conversations are very very different now. The way we mentor each other is very very different now than than what it was. Um, and, and it's just like it, it'll evolve. But man, I wish I had this in my career. Like if I'd because I, I felt like such a I felt alone in my career a lot, you know, like you were sort of just part of the herd moving towards something, not really understanding what was possible, not really understanding, am I getting a good deal here? Could it be better somewhere else? Uh, what, what are my options here? How do, are other people happy? Are they sad? Are they motivated? What motivates them? But just, yeah, just sort of moving towards something that I wasn't really clear what it was or if I even wanted to go there. And I think if I had had that mentoring, back then, I, th I think things could have turned out differently as well. I could have vented some of my frustrations earlier on instead of, you know, um, having the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, if you had a signpost at the top, yeah, that, that would have been really helpful. I, I, I definitely resonate to that. I think, again, it's, it is, I remember the first few months and even years of, of working as a data scientist and being like, wow, I have so many doubts and questions and things like that. And maybe it's just me and I need to not talk about it and not bring it up to anybody. But talking to people who are a lot more senior, who are like, hey, look, it doesn't matter. Or look, pay attention to this or enjoy that. Um, mm. That was like, that just perspective of people who've done the thing for longer is incredibly valuable. I think that's something that anybody can take away and, and I think any field, just having people who you can have those honest conversations with. I think that's also really hard 
to because you need to be open to someone criticizing what you're doing yeah. but understand that they really do care and that they're seeing that because they 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 care and we all have this once you do something and you pour a lot of energy and someone says yes but and and you have to be able to receive that as well i think it's a hard task but if you can go through that it's it's really valuable yeah and understand that you have the opportunity to to amplify whatever it is that you're doing whatever it is you're both doing and this can go in either direction so it could be in a positive amplification like yes this rules we're, we're going somewhere it's the right thing to do or it could be the other way around so if you were unlucky enough to be to end up being mentored by someone who was negative really negative and they were going to pull you down and you were what you really needed was to be lifted up i mean that that that's not a that's not a great situation you could end up exactly where they are yeah. because remember they're not they also don't want to be alone so two negative people oh i'm not alone you feel like this too you might end up in a situation where you're that con you're just confirming each other's negative ne negativity if that makes sense so it's yeah, it's 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 a tr tricky thing to do, but it, it's totally worth the journey. It's totally worth trying this out a few times, like approaching people, figuring out like w would this work? What would it look like? And then, you know, if you've only ever tried out one pair of shoes, you think it's the best pair of shoes ever because that's it. You don't know anything different. So try on some more shoes, figure it out. But it, it, it's worth it. Okay, I want to change the topic a little bit i want to get back to um mapscaping and you um we've we've talked a, a lot about um the the finding what we want to do getting help with people you know moving forward and so i want to go a little bit back to, to the conversation we were having a little bit earlier about you have left the job that you have um, that you had sorry do you know what's next <laughs> No, no, I don't. No, I, I don't know exactly how this is, if this is going to work or how it's going to work. I don't. But again, back to the idea of being more uncomfortable standing still than it is to move forward. So I'm just going to move forward. And that said, I, I'm not this crazy risk taker. I could, there's certain things in, in mapscaping that, that's working. Mm -hmm. up, like up until now, I've been calling it a business and it is a business because it generates money in that sense. But maybe it's more of a job because it's, it's like it's not bigger than me yet. So I'm working pretty hard to make it bigger than me and making it more sustainable. And and maybe maybe mapscaping isn't what uh the 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 end looks like. You know, what like maybe maybe that's not what, what it is, but maybe it's a like a stepping stone to something else then. Maybe I can move on to storytelling, marketing, something like that in for for a company. I, I really don't know. But I, I know that I have a lot more options now than what I had before I started doing this. And I know, again, it's just the discomfort of being where I was is, is greater than the discomfort of like moving forward. Also, I think too, because I've been trying new things for a long time now, you get better at trying new things. You get better at, and it doesn't feel as uncomfortable as what it might do. If you're trying something for the first time, it's uncomfortable, it's scary, and it feels really risky. But I've, I've felt this tension before, you know, so like it's, it's almost like an old friend that shows up, you know, ah, ah, the tension is here again, right? Oh, it's risky. It's probably because it's, it's worth it because it's going to actually move me somewhere because if it works, it'll be amazing. And it's worth or, or, or taking that risk. So, yeah. You, you mentioned you want it to be bigger than you. What, what do you mean by that? You know, like in, in geospatial land, we always talk about this this mythical beast called scalability. The idea that you know we can make something that'll you know average stuff for average people essentially solve one problem, the global universal problem in any situation. So I'm not talking about that, but I am talking about making something that's yeah bigger than just me. If I stop today, then mapscaping will stop. And right. That's that's not what I want. I, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm trading time for money essentially so i want to have some sort of scalability in built into it so i have that in terms of podcasting and, and you know this too so if you put it doesn't matter how much effort you don't need to put more effort in to make the podcast for five people or for five million people it's it's media media is scalable like that and and marketing can be scalable as well so i have that scalability built in there 
And the bigger the audience, the more potential I have for for generating revenue. Essentially, I mean, the, the, we we see this all the time with with influencers. We see this with big media companies. The bigger the audience, the more attention you have, the more opportunity comes with that. So that's yeah, that that's one thing I can do to make it bigger than me. But it's still me producing the podcast. I need to show up every week and make a new episode. And some of the things I can give away to other people. So I have an editor as well. So that that saves me a, a bunch of time. But I still do. The, the final touches and add on intros, outros, that kind of thing. So things I could do to make this bigger than me would be refine my process. Who can I give these jobs away to? Uh, obviously, you need to be able to pay people. So you need a certain amount of revenue to be able to do that. Another thing I'm doing is I have, uh, so I, I work with a bunch of really talented people on a platform called Upwork. And these are people that are freelancers, they do different things, but I, I work with them as writers. So I'm, I'm dyslexic. I'm not real great at writing. So I can, I can farm that job out to people. But I enjoy doing things like SEO research. And I know that to support each podcast episode, if I want traffic to my website, I, do, I need to do something more than what I'm doing now. So I have, I have an editor, and she is fantastic. And I have these five, six, seven freelancers that create articles on a semi-regular sort of basis that we can publish on the website. So this is a way where I'm sort of making it bigger than me. So I need to pay for all this. I need to generate revenue to cover all that stuff. But I don't need to do it myself. You know, I don't need to sit there myself. So one of my ideas is that the more traffic I can get to my website, the more discoverability the podcast has, all, all that kinds of things, which leads on to maybe a little bit more technical conversation about, about marketing. But this is this is something I'm trying to do. I'm trying to... Another way of scaling is, is perhaps through consistency, like building collaborations. So with, with sort of like-minded, like-minded partners, organizations. So I've got a collaboration now with uh, the Open Geospatial Consortium. So we're going to create podcasts together. So this is another way of sort of building in a little bit more stability into the system. And, and I want to do more of that kind of stuff. I want to touch, I want to expand a little bit on the hiring process of finding those people in the process of making it bigger than yourself. We, we've talked about it in some of those sessions that we have together about like how tricky that is to, to find those people. And I think you have some quite interesting thoughts on that. C could you elaborate on like what the process was like for you to find those people who help you make it bigger than yourself? Painful. That's the way the process is. <laughs> but you get better at dealing with the pain. And to be clear, like, so I'm not hiring full-time staff or anything like that. I don't have the burden of uh, insurance and, and paying, you know, high, high wages every month, all of that kind of stuff. The, the, these are freelancers uh, on, on Upwork. So it's not, uh, we, we have a, a different kind of commitment to each other. So, but for, <laughs> what, what I found is you need to be willing to spend money. It, it, just, it just costs money, right? So you need to have, if you, you don't have like a couple of hundred dollars to put on the line, well, don't do this. Don't, don't do it because you just waste time and you, you waste money. So it, let's say I'm hiring for a new writer. I'm looking for someone to help me create a content that, that I'm going to be proud of and that they can be proud of and that we'll be proud of when it lands on our website. I'm looking for someone who has a bit of experience sometimes. Uh, but the process starts with making a job. So trying to describe the job. Uh, as briefly as possible, sorting out, like, who replies? It's, it's so interesting. What do they say? Uh, some people just, you can tell it's so standard. And you just, I, I just, at the start, I, I spend a lot of time writing back and forth to those people. And I've realized that if you, if it's not a hell yes at the start, in that first description, it's a hell no. And it's so, I'll get like 30, 40 replies as sort of a standard job um, post on, on Upwork. And it's pretty easy. From those 30 or 40 like 15, 20 of them are hell no, just based on the description, like based on their reply. Hell no. Da, 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 da. Gone. If you already have doubts at the start, it's not worth pursuing. And then so, so let's say I've got 20 left. I will start writing to those people. 80% of those people won't write back to me. They had a great uh, application. Yeah, it looked good. They Maybe they had a portfolio. Maybe they didn't. 80% of them won't reply to the, to the next question that I sent them. And so my process now is I'm, tr I'm trying to make it a little bit painful for them. I'm trying to see who's going to show up again. Who's going to be back here tomorrow? You know, who's going to be back here in five days time? 
who's going to mm. keep replying to this message? And it's the easiest thing for me to do because I, I'm just one one person. I have a lot of other things to do. So I'm not trying to be rude to these people, but I, I do. This is a way of testing. So I'm prepared to spend a fair bit of money, or not a fair bit of money, you know, but hundreds of dollars to, to find the right person initially and then sort of carry on paying the money throughout our working time together. I'm, I'm ruthless at the start when it comes to you know, who makes it to the next round, who am I going to engage with? And then I, I make it a little bit painful. And my by painful, I mean like, so I write to them, oh, can you give me, send me an example of that? Just a quick message. And who, who replies? How long does it take? And then there'll probably be five or six messages like that over maybe a week, a week and a half sometimes. And by that stage, most people are gone. They, they just don't care enough to carry on. And the ones that care enough to carry on, I've, I've found anyway, uh, are the people that I, that I like to work with, that I want to work with. And then can, can you uh, elaborate just on the time frame that it's taking you to, for example, finding an, an editor I know has been something pretty tricky? Yeah. So finding an editor, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's that been really tricky because there's a lot of trust involved there. And basically it was a, a, a woman that I've been working with for a while. She started off writing show notes for me and was, was doing a great job. But, you know, your, your job, like, so... I won't be able to, they'll quickly get to a place where I, I can't pay them what they're worth. I, I just won't be able to. We don't generate enough money for that. So my job is to find the next thing. What what else can I do to, to make them stay, to motivate them to stay? Can I, where are they going? So this is a question I asked all of them. Where are you, where are you going? How, how can I help you get there? Um, can I help promote you in different ways? Can I give you more responsibility? Is it experience that you're looking for? And so with that, with my editor now, I could just feel that she, she was the kind of person that, that needed something else. So I asked her, look, would you like to do this? I, I don't want to lose you. What, what can I do? Can we, can I, yeah, I can increase the, the pay a little bit, but like pretty quickly we're going to hit a ceiling. So, so what is it that you need? And it turned out what she wanted was to have more control to the, to move up the system a, a little bit. So Great. Well, here's these five other writers. Uh, here's a list of keywords of topics that I, I think might be interesting. This is my idea of how these are going to mix together and um, sort of support the podcast articles or podcast episodes that we're already creating. Um, there you go. There, there's your control. There's the, there's the next step. And then I'll, I'll, I'll pay you slightly differently as well based on, on these other five factors. But again, like but this is really important to understand thinking that you can hold people down, I, I think is a, a bad approach. So I understand that these people are on the way to bigger things. I hope all of them are. It, it pains me to say it, but I hope none of them are working for me in, in a year's time. I hope they've moved on because you know, that that's, that's evolution. So my job is to, to get them where they're trying to go. Basically. Do you think having been like an employee and in a position where you didn't, uh, necessarily like what you were doing helps you in in hiring and in finding the people and working with people uh yeah i, I think have been having been on the other side yeah is a, is a very very useful experience it gives you a lot more empathy but also i, I think what what would i want you know would, would i want someone to that these are intelligent people would i want someone to sort of lie to me and sort of string me along and sort of try and keep me if, if it wasn't the yeah. best thing for me or would I stay because someone saw me where I was trying to go. So offered the extra help. So an example that can I, can I tell you a little story here? Please. So I, I used to work as a, a glacier guide in uh, Franz Joseph in New Zealand. And our job was to put on these old leather boots with nails, like literally nails coming out of the bottom of the leather that would hold us onto the ice. We'd have these huge ice axes. So they might weigh like, I know the head of them might weigh like four and a half kilos kind of thing. Big hickory handles, you know, that came up to your waist. That They were heavy. And our job was to cut steps in the ice up the front of this glacier. The glacier was moving about a meter and a half a day. And it was a wild time. Like it rained a lot there. The face fell off it. It was insane. It was an insane work environment. And we worked like demons. So 12-hour days, uh, typical New Zealand. So we're working on a glacier regardless of the weather in shorts and t-shirts, not because that was the most practical, but because that's what we had <laughs> and it was cold. And so we're just working all of the time. And so some days the face of the glacier would literally fall off. 
Like, so you'd be confronted, you show up at work in the morning and be confronted by a, a 200 meter high vertical wall of ice. And that's what you had to work with that day. So you'd have to climb up the side of the mountain <laughs> in the torrential rain, traverse along, get on where it was flat and start cutting steps down the face of this thing, finding out, well, where is it that I can get down there? It can't be impossible. We've got people to take up here. And sometimes it might take a week to put a trail back in and then it might be gone the next day because things had changed again. So my point with all this is to give you some context. We worked really, really hard. and We got paid almost nothing for it. But what the boss did, every two weeks we'd have this staff meeting and we all knew that we were going to get free pizza and beer. And we were going to sit around and, yeah, it was framed as a staff meeting. We we're going to talk about staff stuff. We we're going to talk about work. He was going to tell us a little bit about you know, what his vision was or where we were going, the things we were facing that week, the, the, you know, what, what our jobs looked like, that kind of thing. But what we showed up for was the camaraderie to be together with the others, like people that got us, and for the pizza and the beer. It cost him nothing to buy us pizza and beer. But because he did it, and it was generous about it, like we worked, no one asked for a raise, everyone thought they were getting a great deal, and everyone was happy. And I think about that all the time. Pizza and beer made us feel seen. You know, it didn't, it, 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 compared to the our working conditions and the job we were doing, yeah, we, we weren't, we were radically underpaid. But just being feel, felt like someone saw you, I, I see you, you know, here, have, have some pizza, <laughs> have some beer. Like if he saw us at the pub, he would, he would shout, you know, like here, have some, you know, I'll, I'll buy the first round kind of thing. It cost him nothing, but he made us feel seen. And so we stayed. I'm just taking that in. <laughs> yeah, one one of the things I think about that sometimes is maybe this is uh, going a bit on a on a tangent, but is that um, that can quickly turn into like to play a little bit devil's advocate, right? That can quickly turn into like a cheaper way of like maintaining low wage on people as well. So we, that's probably a thin line uh, uh, as well to thin ice to walk on you know to stay on the glacier <laughs> great analogy well done yeah 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 right and this is why i always say like where are you going because and and to be open and honest about it okay you know where are you going how can i help you get there because that's the bit of the the conversation that's the bit of the statement that means that you're not just trying to hold on to them for for nothing you're not just looking for cheap labor open and honest like i can afford to pay you this this is what i can offer I, but what I'm going to do is help in any way ca I can to get you to that other place. Do you need a reference? Uh, so w when is it? Like at some point we, we reach a point where we're really happy with, with the work that these people are doing. Let's put your name on the website. Let's, let's link to whatever it is that you're doing. We have a, a reasonable reach through, through social media. Let's, let's boost your profile. Let's, um, let's, let's have a call. So I know one of the guys that I work with, he, he wants to be a content creator. So, here, let, let's get on a call when it suits you and maybe I can help point you in the right direction. Uh, maybe I can, uh, through some of the contacts I have with some of the businesses that I, I collaborate with, like, can we do something else? Is there an opportunity to do so, some a different kind of work? Can I, so one of the things I really want to do is get a hold of some of these businesses that create amazing data but create no content to, to back it up or explain how mm -hmm. it could be used and say, look, why don't you just give me your APIs I have some freelancers over here that would, would love to spend all day like making beautiful maps based on your data. Like, can, can we arrangement like that? And that kind of arrangement, I could afford to pay these freelancers more. I could afford to give them more experience. You know, and I'm not saying any of these answers are right for everyone. There'll be people listening to say, that, that sounds awful. And yeah, maybe it's not right for you. But for the people I'm working with, I, I th it might be right for them, you know? And if nothing else, like, I'm trying. I'm trying yeah. to get them somewhere. I understand that they're going to leave at some stage. So I'm trying to say, well, what is it that you need while you're here? Let's go a little bit on the on the marketing side. I, I know this is something that um, you're quite interested in. And, and also, as you mentioned, you've done like over 180 podcast episodes in this field of geospatial. Like you've talked to a lot of people doing a lot of things who are trying to get attention on what it is they're doing. What is it that, that you see um, in this industry, in this geospatial map making 
whatever we want to call it, industry, um, more as like a broad stroke uh, trend. Like, do you think overall this industry is wonderful at selling itself or, or not at all? Or are you seeing disparities where people are great at it and, and others not? I'm, I'm curious to, to, to like, if I were to consult you on marketing and geospatial, like what, what would be the introduction? So I think, um, I think we are awesome at creating data. They were amazing at creating data and they would totally drop the ball in terms of storytelling with that data. At least this is my opinion. I see that we live in a world where no one is afraid to say content is king or content is important. Attention is becoming more and more scarce and it's becoming more and more expensive to get. A lot of the platforms are really, really visual. And in my mind, we, we totally drop the ball in terms of making visual content for the for these different platforms. I see a huge amount of potential there. Uh, I see platforms like YouTube being under underutilized. And I think you see the same thing. I think part of me think, or I know that you see this as well. You see there's, there's an opportunity to do content differently, to tell stories differently, to, to bring a level of professionalism to it that hasn't been around before. So I see all of that kind of stuff. I see a it, it appears to be mostly B2B focused content that's being created and with people market, like they don't want to market in a modern way. So modern marketing for me would be a, a digital kind of experience, a user experience. What is it at the whole user experience? And I see most people being focused on this B2B, let's all put on our polo shirts and go to the next conference. And I'm going to talk to you. You're going to talk to me. We're going to talk to each other. Have you seen that meme? where all the Spider-Men are standing around in a circle going, you're Spider-Man. No, you're Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of what the conferences feel like to me. Um, so I, I see a ton of potential here. Whether, but I also see a huge educational burden. So the, a lot of the marketers that I talk to have been doing the same thing for a long time. Change is really tough. And I, my guess is most of them don't want to change. Like in a perfect world, they just keep doing the same thing and have it work. They don't want to try different stuff. And that this is not like a slight on, on the marketers that I see that I have engaged with. It's just a observation that this is the way people are. You know, we'd prefer not to have to change, not to have to rethink too much. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's a breath of fresh air. A lot of the times it's an unwanted inconvenience. Do you have examples on that? So the reason I started writing detailed show notes, paying for someone to do it, was not because I thought that I'd want to rank, uh, not that I thought that our, our little website at the time could rank, could compete against the, the Esri's of the world and uh, you know, the, the hexagons of the world because they all want to rank for the same message. And they've been around for you know, a thousand years and have a lot of traffic to their websites and great content, all this kind of stuff. They have this sort of status in the market, if you will, that it's pretty hard to compete with on a lot of, you know, on a lot of different planes. But the reason I started writing show notes was people wanted to link to it. They understood what a pay, a web page was. They, they, they got that and they got the written word. And blogging must be like, what, what is it? Like the, the oldest form of content creation on the web, essentially blogging, like the oldest technology that we have for putting content onto the web. But this is what they get. They didn't get the podcast. They didn't understand in, in a lot of ways that they still don't. They don't understand that the where the attention is because it's not visible it's why would i link to apple podcast why would i send someone to spotify again I, I don't understand as soon as i put show notes on the website and said there's your episode there people would link to it and a light went off in my head and said i'm not doing this because i'm going to rank for it i'm doing it because this is what they want and <laughs> do, do you understand where i'm going they they connected yeah. with this this is what they knew they knew web pages they knew show notes they knew articles that's what they knew. Podcasting, even though it's been around for 20 years, is a new medium. And it's important to understand how long it takes for this to get through society. So you you will see this all the time because you're in the same business I am. You'll see people show up and they'll have a terrible microphone. They won't have a storyline. They'll be a not ready. They won't show up and care. But put those same people on a stage, they get it. Oh, I'm going to wear my good clothes. You know, I'm going to have a suit and tie. I'm going to look professional. I'm going to practice. I'm going to make slides. I'm going to do all these things because it's, I know that. I know what it's like to stand on a, a stage. And they'll do that for 20, 30 people. I have people that, 
that I need to coach people all the time and they're showing up for thousands of people. Thousands of people are going to listen to them for 45 minutes, but they don't show up in the same way with the same level of care because it's new, because they don't understand it. So it, does that answer the question? Yeah, a little bit. I, I guess then the, the work on what you're seeing is it's show it's, it's like marketing the marketing basically like showing like there's value here and what are what are you trying to do with your marketing you're trying to spread your message and this is the there's these tried and tested methods of doing that but there's also these new approaches uh, kind of pains me to say podcasting is new because uh, again it's been around for such a long time but also that's that's on so that's on the medium do you see things on the content itself on on like how we are showcasing the, the 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 products and the tools and even the data actually that is produced like satellite imagery produces i don't know 100 billion terabytes of data a day uh, you know give or take um and i feel like we were able to talk about the the number of bands the resolution things like that like that talk to a very specific crowd but it's some of the most pretty images that we ever take and yet it still feels like it's it's underutilized one of my favorite uh examples of that is there's a lot of uh people who are doing great maps with satellite imagery but i think the most popular account on instagram that does satellite imagery has like a million and a half followers, something like that. And all they do is time lapses of interesting stuff. And yeah. there's there's no mention of like, oh, this is high resolution imagery or something. They just take the images, they make a, an animation of it and probably uh, you know boost the contrast, things like that. And it's amazing. And you see, I don't know, like the River Nile over a year change or like a dam fill up and, and down, or you see vegetation, changing over a year things like that and it's super interesting and that to me is like oh my god these guys know how to use this thing and they've they've taken the interesting bits and removed the the boring parts of some of that D do you see things like where we can take stuff like that or do, do you think we need more people from outside who, who don't care about all the the details to, to come and tell better stories um, yeah, so, so I'm all about better stories, no question about that. So I see a couple of things here. I see internally, there's so much happening in our industry. This is part of the reason why I started the podcast is it's hard to keep track, right? It's hard to, it's, it's hard to understand what, what it is that, that's happening. All these different terms and technologies and tools are showing up on a daily, monthly, yearly basis. And, and we, we are technologists. So how do you keep up? So internally, I think that there's a, there's a burden to be lifted. There's an educational burden there. I haven't come across, for example, a great um, email list, like a great email newsletter for geospatial people. If you have any suggestions, send them to me, please. Like something that summarizes things, does it, packages it in a nice way and shows me like what what is going on, what's going on. So internally, we, we have things that we could do better. I think uh, I see a lot of potential internally. Externally, I think we're terrible at it. Externally, we use the same words externally. We're still having conversations about whether it's, you know, uh, geospatial information systems or geospatial information science. We haven't understood that we use those words internally. That's an internal debate. Yeah. You know, that's between experts. We can use that language there. When we go out there to the rest of the world, we shouldn't talk like that. That they, they don't care. They really don't care. It's not to say it's not important. It's just to understand who you're talking to. And it seems to me that we all seem to have like the one pitch, you know, the question, what, what is GIS? What do you do? It doesn't change depending on who you're talking to. It should, because the packaging matters. So change it like, you know, a different pitch for a different person. There's no one size fits all. And I, I see us as an industry using this one size fits all approach. Oh, this is good enough internally. It's good enough to talking to the customers that are already our customers. Awesome. Let's also use it externally. And I, I think it's a mistake. And I think, it's super interesting. I think I know the account that you're talking about. And you're right. It's just beautiful pictures. Beautiful pictures of looking at the earth. It's amazing. Millions of people watching it. Millions of people engaging it. 
And some of those millions of people will slowly but surely over time understand what's possible. Someone will be a business owner there. Someone will be looking at that time lapse and go, wow, I could build a business around that. That's information that, that I want. How can I get that? And I think if we're going to grow the pie, I think there's a huge educational burden to lift. And I, I think we, we all have a responsibility there. And I, I think, so actually, I think companies like Esri, some of the big companies in the world, that they, they do a good job of, they're like the Titanic that go in front. They have the budget. They have the, the status in the market. They push through the, the ice <laughs> and they, they tell people, this is possible. This is possible. And it's, it's really important. People need to hear that message again and again and again. They need to see it. They need to experience it from different angles. And yeah, I, I think there's, there's so much potential. But that Instagram account that you're talking about is a great example. A million people watching, engaging with satellite imagery. Not because it's different from the imagery that we talk about. There's nothing. It's just packaged differently. That's it. How do you think one can get better at that, at this external communication? I'm also asking for maybe specifically for technical or scientific people. Do you have any advice on how you can get better at that? Practice. Like if you want to get better, this sounds like a really arrogant thing to say and a smart ass thing to say, but I mean it. Practice. Like, um, so I, I communicate to a relatively technical audience and my, my content is framed in that way, but I practice a lot. So on the social media accounts that I have, I will post things and I'm not spamming people, but I'm packaging it different. I'm finding a different graphic. I'm using different words and I push it out there. Yeah. And sometimes it might be the same link three, four times a month, but understanding that like a fraction of your audience is going to see this, this is an opportunity to take more swings, to take more swings. You know, just just practice, get it out there and think about who is this for? What is it for? Did it work? Hmm, try again. Did it work? Try again. Did it work? Try again. I think it's much easier for individuals to practice like this than it is for companies. Companies have this thing where they're, they, they get in their own way. They get in their own heads. They think that everything is like do or die. They don't understand that if you don't like it on social media, just delete it. You can't remember all of the posts you saw yesterday on Twitter, I, I can't either because they weren't remarkable because they weren't worth remembering because most of it was just crap. Let's face it. Most of it just disappeared. It didn't cut through the noise. So I think we need companies to be a little bit more risky to remove some of the brand, not to, not to rand off the edges so much as what they do, not to dehumanize the work that they're doing and who they're doing it for and try again and try again and be a little bit braver, I think. I think it's a little bit sterile at the moment. So what I'm understanding is you're saying there's also like, a, it's easier for an individual to try that out, to tinker around with that, because there's also maybe less uh, risk and less cost associated to it. You can, you can uh, play around with things. You can try out things. Totally. And I think people follow people. Someone asked me the other day why I don't have a, 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 like a, a LinkedIn account for mapscaping. And it's because no one cares about businesses. I see some huge accounts on there with lots of followers, no engagement, no, no one, no one cares about the things they're posting there. I think part of it is like, I, I would really like to hear from another human. Thanks. And we, we trick ourselves into, into scalability. And when we think about our communication, I think scaling communication, you can scale the method or the, the medium that you use. But the communication itself can't scale to, scale to everyone. It's different messages for different people. Why is your Twitter account called Mapscaping and not Daniel? That is, uh, that's a good question. But that's, uh, it started off as something quite different and it's kind of evolved over time. I have thought about it. If I should start my own Twitter account. But to be honest, my, my goal isn't to spend more time on Twitter. Like my goal isn't to, to do those things. My, my goal is something else. And I find it stresses me out being on social media. I, I pay too much attention to it sometimes. And my focus is really on trying to make the best podcast I, I possibly can and trying to grow this thing. So I've got this little flame, you know, I'm trying to grow it into something else. And I find, and I think that's, that's really where, where I want to put my effort. So I don't, I'm not tweeting constantly. I'm not posting constantly on LinkedIn. Yeah, I, 
I want to be present in those places because it's another contact point. People can reach out to me there. We could have a conversation there. We could start something there. And that's really important to me. But if you want to hear from me, well, yeah, I'll, I'll be there most weeks for you in, in the podcast. I'll share some ideas there. You can hear from me there. And that's the kind of relationship that I, I really want to have with people. I've built, when Mapscaping was something different, I built some relatively big social media accounts. So at one stage there, we had like 60, 70,000 followers on, on um, Instagram. And the Facebook page was about the same, 80,000, 90,000. I can't remember exactly. But you know what? Those people had no connection to me. Like there was nothing, you know, there wasn't the relationship. It wasn't that they weren't engaging with what I was doing. They weren't engaging with the deeper message. They were just sort of following along. So the value of those accounts was was almost nothing. But the time it took me to build them was re- was a lot. Mm. It was expensive you know, in terms of that. I put a lot of energy into it. I learned a lot from doing it. But it's made me realize now, like, well, I'm going to show up for these people here that care enough to build this kind of relationship with me. So I'm going to focus on that. But I think Twitter, social media, Instagram, whatever, emails, these are all easy barriers to entry. You can take a lot of swings there and figure out like what, what you, what is your message? And it can change. It can evolve. And you can try different things there. And it's a place to be heard. And it's a place to connect. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with those places. But that, that's a long-winded way of saying this is, this is why Mapscaping, for example, is Mapscaping and not Daniel on, on, on Twitter. Yeah, I, I guess I was trying to hint at the, to just what you mentioned about like – people follow people not not brands and, and why go but, down the I, I mean there, i know there's this historical context but have you thought about changing it to the the daniel do doing who podcast or uh... <laughs> no 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 i haven't but the way i show up on twitter is also like this is me that this is yeah i people should know or will will figure out pretty quickly if they follow the account that this is a person behind there this is a person who has thoughts and it's a person who share stuff and but the idea is that it's a doorway to to the podcast there's more of that in the podcast and that's really really where i want to focus i can't focus on everything i think that's a pretty good place to to start rounding things off um i also like ending them asking people for for books and, and podcast recommendations um do you I think the last time you recommended uh, people check out, um, I forgot the name actually, but some, uh, oh, Akimbo, that's it. Um, yeah. Do you do you have any other recommendation or do you think people should just uh, keep taking a look at that? So that's a, a, a podcast around marketing mostly. Yeah, so Akimbo is still a, a great place to start. I'm constantly... <laughs> At the moment, the, the guy behind it, Seth Godin, is republishing some older episodes, and I find myself listening to them again and resonating with them again. You know, I think it, it's amazing. Smart. Yeah. Um, Hidden Brain is a great podcast as well. I'm not mm-hmm. sure if I recommended that last time. And I would recommend getting a good podcast player so you can actually find stuff that you're interested in. So be ruthless oh, nice. about your who you decide to follow. You know, people say, what are you, the average of the five people you spend most time with? So you're going to spend a lot of time with these people. So be ruthless about it. And a good place to start would be getting a good podcast player where you can search and find things that actually resonate with you as opposed to just putting up with whatever's there. So that that would be my recommendation. So let's, uh, let's wait, you can't just say that and not recommend something. <laughs> well, I've tried a bunch of different podcast players and I'm, and I'm, and I'm in between them at the moment. So I've got no sort of clear favorite at the moment, I have to say. What are you bouncing off of? Oh, can, can I get my phone and look? Yeah, sure. While you do that, I, I think one of my favorite things, this to getting a little bit nerdy on the podcast thing, is that most people uh, already have a podcast app on their phone. And I'm not talking about Spotify or Apple Podcasts. I'm talking about YouTube because it's the biggest podcast player there is and i think it's one of the best places to actually discover podcasts um because it's super hard otherwise and there's like youtube is going to recommend you stuff and it's not great sometimes but it still is some of the best things that there are out there and there's visual elements a lot of them have clips as well there's a very low barrier to entry 
specifically for those of us who are making very long conversations? So I, I would, I, I hear you, I totally hear you on that, but I would push back on it being a podcast player <laughs> <laughs> because you know, know. if you're not looking at the screen or my screen has a screensaver on it. So as soon as that screensaver goes on, it, it dies. So I don't find it a great listening experience. I could definitely see people putting it on like a, a browser and having it in the background. That would be great. I think like I, I would, I would do that. And have it in the background while I was working on my desktop, for example. But like as a podcast player, um, you know, that's not me. So I have a app at the moment. I have Google Podcasts because that's on my Android phone. So I use that sometimes. When I want to remember what a, a really terrible podcast player is like, I go back to that one. And I'm constantly surprised at how, considering that they live off of search, I'm blown away by how poor their search is on podcast players. So at the moment, I'm trying out Podcast Addict. And an, an app called Fountain. I haven't so heard of Fountain. Ones, I, I know uh, Podcast Addict. I think the, the best one on um, iOS is probably Overcast for those of us on, on iPhone. Yeah, I think, I think I've tried that one as well. But like I say, I'm sort of bouncing around between at the moment. I've realized that I need to sort of up my game on that. <laughs> um, great, Daniel. Thank you very much for, again spending some of your valuable time with me, having another uh, conversation with me on the podcast. We, we talk pretty often, but this one was recorded. Uh, so I just wanted to say I really appreciate the time and the conversation as well. Same here, Max. Like, it's, it's always a pleasure talking with you. And it's, I got to tell you, it's a real honor to be invited on. Like, I'm sure people say that, guests say that to you all the time. But if you haven't been a guest on a podcast before, especially one like this, it's really flattering to have someone see you and make you feel listened to. And that's what I, what I get out of being on this. Like I enjoy the conversation, but that it's such a compliment to have someone like pay attention to you in this way for, for a long period of time. It's, it's, it's wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That means a lot. Um, and to probably uh, hear it on the other side, for those who are not familiar with, probably go check out the Mapscaping podcast on whatever podcast app you have. <laughs>